Baltimore skyline may be dotted with construction cranes, but the frenzy of activity has done little to ease what many say is a deepening housing crisis. There's an increasing homeless population, residents must dedicate the greater share of their income to rent, and the most glaring problem, few solutions from City Hall. The lack of progress stands in stark contrast to the array of tax breaks and public subsidies bestowed upon wealthy developers, a practice that has diverted hundreds of millions of public dollars into private hands. Which brings us to the question on not just why this imbalance persists, but what can be done about it? To help me answer, we have assembled a diverse panel with a variety of perspectives. Jeff Singer has worked on homelessness for over 40 years in Baltimore and is a professor at the University of Maryland School of Social Work. Terrell Askew is a member of the Baltimore Housing Roundtable, an organization that is advocating for long-term solutions to the city's affordable housing shortage. And Stephen Janis is an Emmy Award-winning journalist, author of three books on policing, and an investigative reporter for The Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. But before we get started, we have a video report from Stephen. We need all the help we can get around here. The Habitat, that's a good project. We need that. On this nondescript side street, Councilman Bill Henry has a radical idea, at least for Baltimore. We've seen lots of examples of this for big downtown tiffs around the edges of the harbor and such. But one of the things that we could do is something like what's happening down here in Woodburn McCabe. He wants to give tax breaks to stimulate investment in poor communities, not just wealthy neighborhoods. Part of his solution are to offer TIFs to projects like this rehab program managed by Habitat for Humanity. When they improve those houses and um, take what was vacant and blighted and turn them into um, you know, great occupied houses with neighbors in it who are going to be part of the community, when they do that, they're going to also raise the value of the properties around them. TIFs, or tax increment finance deals, allow developers to invest their property taxes in construction and were intended to help blighted areas attract investment. But as Henry notes, that is not what has happened in Baltimore, where construction cranes dot the skyline in the city's wealthiest neighborhoods while areas like this go without, which is one of the reasons protesters gathered at City Hall last week. Uh, we are asking the city to include $20 million in the affordable housing budget. To hold Mayor Catherine Pugh to her promise to start a $20 million affordable housing fund. We're in a moral crisis, and I mean, we drive around our city and we see people that are forced to live in tents and under underpasses and, and try to find um, housing for a night. Pugh designated just $10 million in the city's latest bond offering for affordable housing, a move she defended, but advocates say falls short. The city hall today protesting because they said that the money that's being allocated for the bond isn't enough to fund the affordable housing fund that they want to fund, and they feel like you can promise that, and they were upset about it. How do you respond? Well, first of all, I, let me just say that that's not the budget. That's the bond bills. Which is why the council is now focused on changing the city's inclusionary housing law, an ordinance that requires developers who are subsidized by taxpayers to build affordable housing but has no source of funding and to date has produced just 32 units. Well, the goal is to make sure that we maximize, you know, all of our efforts to get as many affordable housing as possible. Because right now what we have is not working. In the several years of the program being in existence, we're talking about only a few dozen uh, units being created, and that's just not enough. But will it be in time, advocates wonder, for a city in dire need of help now? Year after year, there's this serious lack of funding uh, for affordable housing for across the city, which has been an urgent need for decades. So, Stephen, as I mentioned in the opening, there has been a lot of construction going on in Baltimore City. What is it doing to help the affordable housing crunch? Because I see a lot of luxury and high-end apartments being created. Yeah, well, to put it bluntly, absolutely nothing. Because, you know, Right now they're about, I talked to Melody Simmons, who's a reporter for the Baltimore Business Journal, just to get an update on this. Because, you know, driving around Baltimore, you think there's all this construction going on. It's supposed to be great. Well, there's about 2,500 luxury apartments coming online that are coming in the pipeline. And some of them are renting for rents. Like there's a building that's going up right next to the Light Street Pavilion downtown, which is the old like McCormick Spice building. The rents for a studio apartment are going to be $2,000 a month. Now this for is a studio. For a studio. That's incredible. That's like New York rents or right. Washington, D.C. rents. Um, so what you're seeing is a proliferation of luxury apartments that really are, are for the middle class and for, for a city with like an ADI, like a household income around 44000 are just absolutely unaffordable. So really, uh, it's like a mirage. And what's even, I think, worse from people I have spoken to, including Melody, was that the fact that a lot of these apartments aren't getting rented. I mean, besides the 2,500 that are coming online, 
There are multiple buildings that have gone up, all because of a tax break offered by the city to people who build apartment complexes, I think over 20 units or 24 units, um, that are coming online that aren't renting. So really, in reality, what the city has created is, is what you would consider to be a bit of a luxury housing bubble, which is quite ironic given that, you know, given what you talked about in your opening about the dearth of affordable housing, we're literally going to have up $2,000 a month studio apartments that you can't rent. So it's really uh, kind of almost cruel to look at the skyline and see all these buildings go up and know that the people that really need these homes aren't going to be able to afford them. Jeff, I think if uh, anyone drives through the city of Baltimore, they've noticed an increase of the number of people who are living on the street. How bad is this problem, really? It seems to have increased all over the nation um, for the last, uh, well, since the Great Recession, I, I would say, 2007 or so. Uh, but in Baltimore, it's very noticeable. There isn't a major intersection where there aren't two, three, five people begging for money. Uh, the housing crisis is a, a large part of it, as is the problem of incomes. Um, we don't have reasonable wages in Baltimore. Disability assistance will not pay for rent um, in any jurisdiction in the United States, including Baltimore. So this is another problem. Terrell, your organization has come up with a plan called the 2020 Plan, and it's supposed to help increase affordable housing in Baltimore City. Can you tell me a little bit about how that might work? Sure. Um, we call it the um, 2020 um, vision, and it's designed to address um, what we feel are multiple issues that are, are going on in the city. One being affordable um, by creating more affordable housing and, and um, getting city support for that um, affordable housing, and also. Um, um, deconstructing and reusing, um, putting vacant homes to better use than they're being used right now, like green spaces, um, urban farming, things that are meant to um, help stabilize communities and create a more um, a greater economic um, base um, within these um, communities. Well, it sounds like an excellent plan, and I believe Mayor Pugh said that she was going to support it. And I think earlier uh, this week she said that she was going to give uh, a $10 million bond um, assurance for this plan. But your organization still showed up at a Board of Estimates meeting and held a protest. What are your organization's concerns? Our concerns um, with Mayor Pugh is, she, is that she has um, vocalized support for it, but we have noticed that there's been a lack of um, follow through on um, the budget um, proposals and on a, a greater demand on her part for this actual vision to um, be achieved. Um, one of the issues we have is um, she actually came to um, our event, this was from the May 13th event, and spoke on the need for affordable housing. She's spoken about it in, in many newspapers about this issue, but she's still, as of late, has um, lacked the uh, desire to, fo to, to um, show that support, um, um, both um, in, uh, financially. But she did support, what, IT? infrastructure and like fixing the front of City Hall or something, right? Yes, she did. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> which seems to me, well, it's a bad priority. Well, anyway, you know, I don't want to. No, you know. which is, no, um, that's a good point, um, which is one of the things that we took offense to. Um, we consider um, the housing crisis an issue that is um, causing peop um, city residents to lose their lives. Mm. And it shows a, a, a level of irresponsibility and callousness on the part of our city officials to prioritize computers and city hall walls over human lives. Now, Stephen, mm -hmm. there's a law that critics say has been an abject failure, which yeah. is the inclusionary housing law. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about how it's actually supposed to work? <laughs> you know, it's funny. And Jeff and I have talked about this a lot, and we were actually talking before. I shouldn't laugh, but this was sort of the city's answer. Okay, we're, we're putting out all these tiffs and, and activists, and this is years ago, said, well, you gotta have, you gotta, for, if you're gonna give a developer $100 million, 
they should build a couple affordable houses as part of this development it because the city reasonable. taxpayers are subsidizing it. It does sound reasonable. Well, the brilliant plan that the city came up with, and I'm, I'm being honest, brilliant, was that the city would pay for these units. Now, uh, think of it conceptually, right? The city taxpayers give a tax break to a wealthy developer right. and say, well, it's part of that you have to build affordable housing, but we're going to pay for that too. What sense does that make? But hmm. even with that kind of sort of generosity, right. it has generated just 32 units because there's no funding. So it's it's literally like one it's of the most. It's generated only 32 units of 32 or 37. Housing. It's That's something around there, right? Yes, yeah. yes, around 32 uh, since 2007. 10 yeah. years, 32, 32 units. In a decade, only 32 units. Right. Affordable Meanwhile, there've been, been as I said, there's 2,500 luxury apartments coming online just in, right now. So the law, uh, you know, has been an abject failure. I don't think that's um, like an, you know, an Doesn't unfair sound characterization. Like an exaggeration. No, that's not hyperbole. There are about 450 of these laws around the nation. Mm -hmm. Baltimore clearly has the worst one. <laughs> um, it, it's the worst <laughs> in, in design, but even worse than that, it's the worst in implementation because we've had city administration, particularly a housing commissioner, who waived the requirements of the law even when he didn't need yes. to. Yes, and, and, and just as an example to point to what Jeff was saying, so Port Covington, which is the biggest TIF, $600 million TIF given right. to a, a billionaire, yes. um, you know, Kevin Plank, to build out Port Covington, which is a sort of a mini city on the water. And the Department of Housing uh, gave a waiver to that project. Now, in negotiations with an organization called Build, they said, okay, we'll build some affordable housing, but we're not going to build it at Port Covington. Don't make us do that. We can't put it in the same complex because this is for rich people. So they've had to, they, they promised to build it at sites around the city, okay, which is just bizarre, right? So we'll build it, we'll build, I don't know where they're going to build so it. So it's creating a completely separate city for yeah, wealthy people to enjoy. It, it's actually, you know, the, the law is supposed to, you know, sort of dissipate uh, economic segregation right. and it's become a tool for economic segregation. And the thing that I've heard uh, is that they're looking around for developers to, for them to situate or build these units and no one really wants to do it because no one else wants them in their development. So it's like this game of uh, political hot, or development hot potato. So the, the law is completely ineffectual, and in this case, Port Covington gets 600 million or Sagamore. Which is, isn't that one of the largest, Third largest tips tip in, the in the history of, of our state? What it basically says is the people who are paying to fund this have no right to be there, which just shows that this law that's supposed to be inclusionary is uh, actually become a tool for economic segregation, and which is why I always make the faux pas of saying, calling it the exclusionary house. Right, law, sort which of I, a 40 Which I do all the there. time and I, when I talk about it. And so it's just, it's like as Jeff was saying, it's, it's arguably one of the worst implemented laws in the entire country. Well, if I might supplement that. Sure. Yes. In, in fact, of the 32 apartments that have been built, not a single one went to an impoverished household. They're all for lower middle class teachers mm -hmm. and such, and teachers need housing, but sure. poor people need it even more. Right. Um, and the Port Covington Agreement has no language about including poor people in the housing that that's supposed to build. Yeah, so it could just end up being Incredible. an extra apartment thrown onto a, another TIF generated thing that's renting for, you know, an upper middle class probably income. Who knows? We don't even know. So it's exacerbating this condition of economic segregation. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be a fair characterization. So what is the, is the city council trying to do anything to remedy or rework well, this bill? You know, as, as I went over reviewed my report, there is a movement now on, to start a task force that will be looking at this law, mm -hmm. which is supposed to sort of look at changes. But, but, you know, as the 2020 group has pointed out, you know, you can't do it without a funding mechanism. And, and the funding should come from developers. But, I mean, I'm sure Jeff can speak to this, but the chance, it's like blood from a stone. I mean, this city hates to ask developers to chip in anything. So, you know, is the city going to pay for this? Is, uh, who's going to pay for this? I mean, there are some proposals, and I can talk about them. I mean, sure. Councilman Bill Henry has proposed a tax that would take money out of the recordation taxes for properties over a certain value, which is the money you pay when you transfer a property, that would set up a fund to do this. But, you know, I, I mean, I, I've never seen the history of the city council. I've been covering it for 12, 13, 14 years. I've never seen them do anything to tax developers on any level that I can imagine. So There's a, a tiny building permit fee that goes to homeless services, but it, it generates under $200,000 a year, mm -hmm. I believe. Um, so yes, this is a problem. Now, developers are often asked to contribute, but not 
to the uh, well-being of the city, but to the campaigns of right. the politicians. I see. I mean, it's the biggest gravy train in the city is development, which is why you see all these luxury apartments coming online. Because, you know, if, if you want to raise money as a politician, do a favor for a developer. It's where wealth is created. Uh, and it's where it's really a great exemplar of how, you know, it kind of parallels the American income inequality sort of movement <laughs> where the city is literally enriching people from outside the city with taxpayer dollars who aren't allowed to participate in any of the sort of growth that it creates. Oh, that's part of the reason why um, with the 2020 um, campaign we stressed the need for community involvement with, um, with, with the development of the neighborhoods because we felt that it, the city has a proven track record of not um, valuing its, its residents, their input, or the vision that they have for their own communities. And we felt that it's, we understand that um, developers are a big part of the city, but clearly the way they're operating and have been operating isn't working when you have a city that's struggling the way it is. And one of the things that um, we've ran into was we were, um, like for example, on November 8th, we turned in um, petition signatures. One of the things we ran into during the process of getting those petition signatures were hundreds of stories of people talking about the fact that there were other developments that were done in the city and look at what they've done mm -hmm. and just rec uh, recounting the history of how the city fails time and time again to do not only the ethical thing, but the, the right thing I feel and uh, my colleagues feel um, as uh, as um, representatives of residents, and that's to demonstrate that their vision is more important than outside developers who don't have an actual true stake in those neighborhoods seceding. You know, you've spoken at a lot of events, and I want to know why the affordable housing issue is so important to you personally. Um, the affordable housing uh, issue is important to me because I've experienced um, displacement um, as a as a child. Um, I moved more than um, ten times over three years. So I've, um, like I said, I've experienced it. I've also seen the the effects of doing nothing. Like I said, um, that was 20 years ago when I didn't have a home. And there are still people losing their homes now, people who are living on the streets. One of the times where I was petitioning, I remember seeing someone who they basically built a bed out of their belongings. And this is this was a, um, basically around a, a, a uh, further up the street from an area that the city was talking about developing and then that doesn't make any sense that those issues that I experienced as a child are still going on and that very little has been done to truly address those those things even though we've had um, they've been known to be problems for so long. It sounds like it would be incredibly disruptive for a child to have to deal with all that moving, having to try to keep good grades in school, that would put a lot of stress on the family. It sounds really difficult and it's a shame that children are still going through what you did so many years ago. Jeff, I wanted to ask you about our public housing. Now, as we're having an affordable housing crisis, um, isn't the city actually selling our public housing to private developers through the RAD program? What's happening to, what, it's about 11,000 units? What's gonna happen to our public housing? The current RAD plan would reduce the 11,000, approximately a little bit lower than that, uh, down to about 5,000 units of public housing. Uh, the, other units are being sold at a very nice price to developers who get more per apartment than the housing authority was receiving from the federal government. For rent? Um, as a subsidy, yes. 
Yes. Really? Is yes, that through Section 8? Or? That's, that's, it's, uh, yes, uh, it's wow. a part of the Section 8 program. Um, so the that's way, where that make, now that makes sense to me. The way the RAD program was designed, and this is an Obama initiative, I must say, the way it was designed was to privatize public housing okay. by giving bonuses to private developers to take over the housing that the federal government and the city had been neglecting for decades. In fact, in our city, we probably have the worst RAD program, like we have the worst inclusionary <laughs> housing worst program. Inclusionary Come on, housing. Jeff, give us something. No, I'm telling you, this is true. In, in many cities, they haven't been giving the title to the properties to the developers, uh, nor have they been firing the unionized workers that take care of the properties. But in Baltimore, our former housing commissioner actually got rid of 200 union members uh, who worked for the housing authority so it would be more attractive to the private developers oh. to mm. buy the units and then to hire their own staff at far lower wages with, with no, no benefits. benefits and yeah. no union protections. Yeah. Incredible. I mean, you know, it, it just begs the question, like, why didn't they use those profits to refurbish this housing? Why do they have to privatize the profits? I mean, doesn't that, doesn't that sound like kind of insidious, I mean, or stupid or, you know? Oh, it's not stupid. Stupid, but it is insidious. <laughs> it's the neoliberal way. I mean, it's just because you know they, if they had that extra money, they could have used it to, to re. You know, they always say they always plead poverty. And well, they, it is true. The federal budget for housing for poor people mm -hmm. has been declining dramatically. It's now about forty percent of what it was forty years ago. It's about forty percent of what it in was in real dollars. In in real dollars, yeah. yes, taking inflation into account. Um, so that is true. The federal government has been trying to destroy the public housing program, and it, it's a nonpartisan or a bipartisan issue. Republicans, Democrats, it doesn't they matter. They love doing it, right? They hate public programs, and they hate poor people. Uh, so th there is some truth to the notion that there isn't hasn't been enough money to support this, but they've made it worse, and particularly in Baltimore. But you, go ahead, Sam. Uh, um, but let me ask you about public housing in Baltimore City. I've spoken to residents. Uh, residents have to deal with rats, bed bug infestations. Um, I've spoken to women who have had maintenance workers extort them for sexual favors just to get repairs done on their homes and people describing really terrible living conditions. So if public housing is so bad for residents, is, is it actually worth fighting for? Uh, well, very good question. Good the question. problem has been that public housing hasn't been democratically controlled and it certainly could be. All of the public housing developments could be community land trusts that are owned by the people who live there and operated by the people who live there who could then hire folks to, to actually do the work. Um, community land trust, it's a, a wonderful uh, model that the Baltimore Housing Roundtable has been supporting uh, since its inception. And we could have turned all the RAD properties into community land trusts that oh, were wow. operated by the people who live there. That's a good point. And you we could have. suggested that. And at the, the money's time. there. The, yes, the money was there, but no one would listen, including Obama's HUD secretary who came to Baltimore. We specifically said to him, Why don't you think about these reforms? His response was, Oh, we let Baltimore do whatever they want because they're so good. <laughs> yes. Yes. This is that, that is astonishing to me. That yes, is the same Baltimore Housing Authority that had to turn in $75 million back to HUD because they refused to spend it on poor people. The same one that put $150 million into a bank account for the future when at least three to 5,000 people a night are on the streets homeless and they refuse to spend the money for that. Mm. that that's and, you know, really created Gilmore Homes, which became a centerpiece for, you know, the tale of two cities, the entrenched poverty, all the worst ills that, you know, was part at the root of the uprising. You know, that was their, that was their gig. You know, the city has been incredibly supportive of developers with tax incentives, uh, helping them build their luxury, developers. Their, their luxury apartments. What, what kind of impact has this actually had on the city? Well, as we were talking about before, Jeff, and, and we, were, we were all talking about this, it, 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 the thing is we don't know. We, we, we know, we can look around and see that inequality has been heightened because of the apartments, but to really sit and, and say, has someone done an accurate actuarial, actuarial assessment of how much the city has given away, we just don't know. I mean, it, obviously it's hundreds of millions. I mean, wouldn't giving away that tax revenue contribute to things like uh, structural deficits Absolutely. in our public school funding, for example? Absolutely. I mean, that's a really good point. You know, we covered the Kerman Commission 
hearings, which the Kerman Commission has been constituted to task with sort of finding a more equitable formula for school funding, uh, which Baltimore has not been a fair recipient of school funding. But during that, the vice chair of the school board got up and said, you know, hey, people, um, we've given away all this tax tax breaks to developers, it's going to impact school funding. We need to do something about this. Everyone kind of yawn. But the truth of the matter is um, school funding is based, it's a complex formula, but part of it is based on the assessed value of all the real estate in, in a city. And so if, 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 let's say the city's real estate assessed value goes up to a billion dollars, the state says, yeah, you're collecting money on that, so you get less money per student. Well, the problem is that this is tax-free uh, uh, real estate that's growing. So the money the amount of real estate's being created, it, they're not paying taxes. Okay. So, but the state doesn't take that into account. So basically what happens is, is, it, is that it exacerbates the, the inequitable funding because all these wealthy developers, while they do have valuable property, they're not paying taxes they're to support the schools. To the but the state base. figures, hey, that's not our problem if you, if you gave it away, we're not gonna. So really, you know, you're talking about billions and billions of dollars of a say. It's already had an impact, so the state legislator did a sort of temporary fix in 2019 to exempt TIFs, just TIFs, which is only one tax break, which is a tax increment finance. But the pilots and other things, you know, are just massive. Ma every building you see going up, luxury building, is probably funded by a pilot, which means at least for 10 to 15 years, they won't pay taxes. So really, the best we can say is we have no idea. It's, it's like fiscal suicide. We don't know where we're headed. We don't know the impact. Um, they're so uh, you know, eager just to show they can build a building, but they never think about the implications, and they, they're going to be massive. Terrell, since your organization has launched the 2020 Vision Plan, what has been the reaction of other community organizations? Do, do they realize how bad the affordable housing, housing crisis actually is? Do they recognize it? Yes, they uh, do. Um, there have been quite a few um, organizations who have actually um, come on board with us and actually helped us um, with um, getting the um, 2020 vision out there to um, residents. Um, as we've gone through our, round table, our regular roundtable meetings, um, there have been other people who have they've come in to join us and discuss these issues and to try to um, make certain that we can actually convey the full meaning of what we um, want to achieve through the 2020 because a, a lot of people tend to believe that it's just about um, affordable housing including our, including our mayor which she showed when doing the board of estimates she ran off her accomplishments which weren't that many and weren't really accomplishments if you look at the city but good point <laughs> I guess I'm re I'm looking at a different a different a different city, so <laughs> that that could be the case. But um, we one of the things we brought up was that um, jobs from programs like the 2020 should directly impact the communities that they're in, which is why we wanted um, priority to be given to um, city residents so that they would have access to these jobs and truly take part in building their um, communities. But also, um, like you said earlier, um, we discussed land trust and we've been working with a lot of different um, communities to actually cre um, create um, land trust. Um, I've, I've lived in, in Remington and that's one of the communities that's actually um, working on that. Um, We've been looking at different um, properties around the city and trying to determine which ones are um, city owned and to get them to agree to transfer them over to the land trust so that we can start addressing these issues. Um, we've also had um, a crowdfunding campaign which was to purchase the first um, um, community land trust home. Um, it's gonna be in the Curtis Bay area. We've had over um, 500 um, donors throughout the city who have put money towards it. Right now, it's over 35,000 towards the um, down payment. Basically, we've had a lot of people shown that regardless of whether the city um, um, steps up and do the right thing, that community residents are not going to go away, that they're going to continue to strive for a better city. Is it Bill Henry? Um Proposal going to help the land trust thing? I mean, is that what, you know, the, I, I don't, does anybody know? I mean, Bill Henry's proposal to, to take those recordation taxes, is that going to go into community land trust or? 
I don't know. Yeah, that could be a way, because that was what Bill Henry was saying. Does, the land trust. He have a, 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 wasn't he suggesting that the tax incentives that are normally used in the inner yes. harbor in downtown should actually be used by the That's community, the, right? Jeff will, Jeff will know this better than me, but the funny thing he said, we could have given a TIF to any neighborhood. We, there's no and, restriction. And for the record, <laughs> there have been some TIFs and pilots in impoverished parts of Baltimore, in West Baltimore, that is true. East Baltimore. However, by my research uh, and calculation, the differential is at least seven to one, seven dollars for wealthy parts of the city to one dollar for poorer parts of the city. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the two things Councilman Henry wanted was, you know, uh, he, he, it was just a resolution, which is non-binding, that the city create TIF districts in places they normally don't, which would be places where people live who aren't rich. And then, you know, the other thing was to create, I think the recordation tax was supposed to go to places like land trusts, which, you know, are, I think, a great tool, as Jeff, and you point out that. So for those who aren't familiar with the concept of a land trust, w would you mind explaining it? Um, it's a housing tool uh, where uh, basically a community organization would act as trustee over land within their um, jurisdiction, their community, and would... Um, lease the, the property above to um, residents um, where they could either um, choose to rent or um, own while um, keeping it in the, in the actual land trust. And that because, because they, would be, they would have the ability to use the home for different means while um, the land is kept in the, com in the community's control, it would make the um, housing the rents or um, mortgage more affordable and allow more control over that um, community to be um, steer basically without the direction of that community to be steered by the community residents it would be a democratic organization where a third of the of the people who make up um, the control of the, of the trust would be um, residents in that community, another third would be the people who actually live in the land trust, and finally the other third would be experts in the fields that are needed in order to make sure that land trust runs successfully. Mm. It sounds like a really interesting way not only to empower the community, but to ensure that there is affordable housing in that community for years to come. Jeff, I wanted to ask you about an article that you wrote for the Baltimore Brew, which may have stirred up a little trouble <laughs> for you. Um, initially, the uh, mayor and some of the city officials had said there were 2,600 homeless people in Baltimore City. M mayor Pugh rounded that up to 3,000 and said that she was going to raise $350 million to help end homelessness in Baltimore City for that 3,000 people. Does, do those numbers sound right to you? No, no, no. Okay. Those numbers are <laughs> far from reality. Um, every jurisdiction is required to do a count or a census of people experiencing homelessness on one night or two or three. Um, in the winter, January, uh, every two years. It's a requirement in order to get federal dollars. Okay. Baltimore's last count, which was in January, found 2,699 people, I believe. Um, however, a, it's only a nightly count. B, the enumerators don't go everywhere people are sleeping who are experiencing homelessness. You know, Baltimore has 43,000 vacant houses, and a lot of them are what we call abandoniums. They're places where people live. But the enumerators don't knock on the door of every vacant house, nor do they go deep into every park or into garages where so many people stay. Uh, so we know it's an undercount. There's been some research that demonstrated that even for people they see on the street, about 41 percent are ignored because they don't quote look unquote homeless. But Jeff, um, aren't a lot of these people like what about the couch surfing people who aren't like on the street but are just going from home to home or just kind of living nom nomadic existences are those counted in this kind of survey? They're definitely not counted and in fact Baltimore City Public Schools says there are at least 3,000 students who are homeless. So how in the world the city could have oh, a total wow. population of Homelessness that's completely that's contradictory. Right, right, for that's sure. That's incredible. For sure. Oh, that's that's just startling. That contradiction mm -hmm. to me. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about another thing that you mentioned in that article, that the city, that Mayor Pugh was looking to put that $350 million into a plan based on the model of the Helping Up Mission, who does uh, transitional housing for homeless people. Does that sound to you like an effective way to make sure people have long-term housing? For the most part, no. There may be some folks who benefit from transitional housing, mm -hmm. but the United States has evolved in our responses to homelessness over the last few years, and the, f the federal government no longer supports the concept of transitional housing, and homeless advocates uh, generally don't either. We believe that people need their own permanent affordable housing, and our plans to end homelessness need to guarantee that there's a sufficient supply of affordable housing with some supportive services to be sure. Uh, but the notion that transitional housing at whatever cost, $350 million, just has no bearing on the real problem. The real problem is that 92,000 households in Baltimore cannot pay their rent every month. 92,000, 38.6% of all our households. 150,000 times a year, landlords file for eviction notices because people can't pay their rent. It's a huge so the, the idea that we could build a small supply of transitional housing and work our way out of homelessness isn't sensible. We need new macro social policies that both create affordable housing and decrease income inequality and give people enough money that they can live. So we've been talking about solutions, various programs that might work. What do you think about the political will to actually make any meaningful change? And have you seen any solutions on the table that look good to you? Well, like I was saying, the 2020 is the first time I've seen really a broad coalition, well, the first time I've seen come into City Hall with the demands that there be affordable housing. And that is actually gaining traction, you know, because they have been doing demonstrations and making city leaders pay attention. But unfortunately, because of the economics, that is developers giving money to the politicians and being a main source of, you know, campaign funding in this town, because it's the one thing that council people can do, it's the one thing the American do is give away, you know, tax breaks and real estate. It's gonna be very hard to change that calculus because, you know, it's such a, those, the developers really run the game and you know we have talked to people who said a developer will go to the city and say I need X and the city will say well that's all you need don't you need more so it's really I don't see I think the main the main thing that the city has to be thankful for right now for, is the 2020 movement and and the ideas you guys have proposed because it is concentrated and they are definitely paying attention the fact that Mayor Pugh had to answer questions right. uncomfortable questions uh, and they showed up and held her accountable right. is a major step. She might think twice now about giving out a tiff on Perkins Homes, like which is being discussed. So that is important. More, the more, so the only thing that's going to change it are, are organizations like 2020. Other than that, I don't think we see any change. Terrell, let me ask you, you've, like we said, you just recently had to have another protest to make sure to hold the mayor accountable to her promise. Do you think there's political will to really implement these solutions? At this time, I do not. I believe that, unfortunately, we live in a city, it's, it's not unique in this sense, but where they tend to go off of a playbook on how to accomplish goals. And this is their go-to playbook. So essentially, we have to change their way of both value, putting value on things in the city, residents over 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 um, development dollars, one and um, two, on truly seeing the the promise and and um, potential of residents in this city. So um, that because of because we are still working on that, it's going to make it a a, a difficult, uh, a more arduous process. Um, but uh, um, as you said earlier. There's a, com there's a complete lack of accountability in this city. Mm -hmm. They tend to police themselves. And mm -hmm. even though that doesn't make sense, we as residents have allowed that to go on for too long. There's, their budget, just like everything else, is supposed to speak to our vision and it doesn't. And we're slowly um, getting people to understand that and getting them to understand that, but we know that it's going, to, it's going to take a lot more for them to actually change the way of look, their, their way of viewing the city. 
Well, I want to thank my guests, Professor Jeff Singer, Terrell Askew, and reporter Stephen Janis for joining me for this really important conversation about affordable housing and the need for it in Baltimore City. I'm your host, Taya Graham, and I want to thank you for joining me at The Real Baltimore.